I want to talk to you about my journey here, my process, which is to try to create or scale what is quite literally a hot approach for making the atmosphere a carbon source for industries. Now, in some ways, this process is so old and such a no-brainer, I can only say it's really kind of criminal. It hasn't been scaled to massive proportions before. Now, I might argue that we're a little over-focused in society on fossil fuel emissions. You heard me right. The amount of carbon that we jack into the atmosphere by the consumption of fossil fuels. For the last couple of decades, we've been told to buy less stuff, eat less meat, plant the tree, drive a Prius, do whatever you can to reduce your carbon footprint. And that's great. But how are we doing to that end? If we actually look at the data, emissions from industry, carbon emissions from industry have gone up since 1960 from two and a half gigatons, a gigatons, a billion tons of carbon, to over 10 gigatons of carbon today. That's a lot. And on Sunday, I was chatting with a good friend of mine who's an atmospheric researcher at NOAA in Boulder, Colorado, about this trend. And he said to me, he says, Mike, you know, a lot of us in the scientific community believe that if those emissions go to zero, I mean zero, that's not enough to prevent the Earth from continually warming for the foreseeable future. I think we need a different approach. I think we need a different approach that first and foremost makes for companies that really think about building products that customers want intrinsically and also happen to subtract carbon from the atmosphere rather than contributing to it. See, if we only focus on emissions, it's sort of like thinking about ascertaining the value of a company by only looking at its liabilities while ignoring its assets on its balance sheet or only focusing on carbon emissions, or excuse me, sources or emissions, and ignoring opportunities to build carbon sinks. So I think there has to be a better way to make these products. Now I'm going to distill everything down for you to a very simple denominator in this approach, um, which is basically the life cycle of a match. Now this match, of course, is made of wood. It's plant matter. And plants have been drawing carbon out of the atmosphere since the beginning of time. And you know the basic chemistry of photosynthesis. Car uh, plants draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with water for the root systems. And with the help of sunlight, they convert that into cellulosic structures, sugars, and, and oxygen. And so you might think if we just let plants grow, in fact, maybe double the number of plants that are in the world, that might make a big difference. Global photosynthesis of terrestrial plants on all Earth is about 120 gigatons of carbon a year. That's a really, really big number. But unfortunately, half of that, folks, is given back to the atmosphere every day, every year, because at night, plants actually produce carbon dioxide. They respire. Another 50 gigatons of that 120 is further given back through decomposition of dead plant matter. Another nine gigs is then further fed back into the atmosphere through disturbance processes, which is another way for saying harvesting, burning, and metabolism, which we're all doing in this room right now. And through that entire process, that leaves us with one measly gigaton of carbon that has now been removed from the atmosphere into net long-term storage, or what scientists would call net biome production. And so we would need to massively increase global photosynthesis to really have a meaningful impact on fossil fuel emissions. You see, the answer is not in how we treat living trees or whether or not we plant more of them, but rather in how we process and treat dead ones. If we can reduce the amount of, of, of decomposition, if we can reduce the amount of disturbance from dead plant matter, then we can begin to make a meaningful impact in the atmosphere. But anyway, photosynthesis is kind of boring. We should really talk about the, the disturbance of this match, which is the burning. You know the book ends of this process pretty well. Once this match is burned, it is converted into carbon dioxide and water vapor. The book ends of this process are not terribly exciting. It's what happens in the middle. So let me unpack the, decompos or the destruction of this match a little bit for you. When that matchstick is lit and that flame begins to move along this lignin cellulosic material, it heats the biomass to about 300 degrees, driving from the biomass pyrolytic gases. Now those pyrolytic gases and vapors are then further burned, 
by the way, I should say that pyrolytic zone is that clear luminous zone, excuse me, that clear luminous zone right along the matchstick. It's an oxygen-deprived area. Those gases are then are further combusted in the, the, the flame and converted into carbon dioxide, moisture, and heat. The heat, of course, continues the burning of the match. The carbon dioxide is now available for additional photosynthesis, and that's a very simple carbon cycle. To address the issue, we have to disrupt the carbon cycle. So how can we do that? The answer is actually in removing oxygen from the process. If we can sustain the heat of the reaction but eliminate the oxygen or air, the air from the process, then we can drive these pyrolytic gases and vapors from the biomass and maybe sell those to industry. What is the overall process? Now let's think a little bit bigger, not from a matchstick, but think of thousands of tons of biomass fed into a reactor like what you see in the middle. In a reactor like this, very hot material is put into direct contact with super hot surfaces and instantaneously heated to about 300 to 650 degrees centigrade, which coincidentally is the average temperature range of a naturally occurring forest fire. We rake the biomass across that, 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 that metal surface. Those pyrolytic gases are liberated from the feedstock. They're whisked away with vacuum. And then we split, cool, and condense those liquids and the contraption on the right into higher value derivatives that can be used for industry. And there's a lot of this biomass available, folks. The US Department of Energy last year confirmed that one billion tons of dry biomass is available every year in the United States without disrupting normal forestry and farming operations. And get this that that is enough to offset 30% of America's petroleum use. That's a big number. It's also kind of a meaningless number unless we convert biomass into derivatives that are useful for industry, and sawdust doesn't quite cut it, does it? So what are these materials? What do we make out of this stuff from tons of biomass? What is the mass balance of this overall approach, which means how much product do we get out, how much pollution, all that kind of stuff? Well, about 30% of the biomass is converted into a biopesticide. The technical term of this is pyroligneous acid. It sounds kind of nasty until you unpack the name a little bit, pyro for heat, ligno for lignocellulosic residue. It's comprised of about 80% water. I should say it's completely to uh, non-toxic, not carcinogenic. I, I hope I get that part right. Some organic acids, namely acetic acid, which is about the composition of normal table vinegar. But most importantly, a couple of hundred light molecular weight phenolic compounds that coincidentally are naturally occurring flavors and fragrances. What's really cool about this stuff, although it's safe for us, is that plant-eating insects hate it. It drives them away. This stuff has powerful antioxidant capacities, and it's also a plant growth stimulant kind of like blood doping for plants. We use just pure heat to drive these materials off of the plant matter. We reapply it to plants to protect them from insects and make them grow faster. That's a pretty good deal for farmers. And people have been using and making their own pyroligneous acid for generations in places like Latin America and Southeast Asia to mitigate pest pressures and help their plants grow and also to accelerate composting rates from months down to days. And yet, in industrial Western farming operations, nobody knows what this is. In fact, about a year and a half ago, I had a conversation with some top researchers at the USDA about pyroligneous acid, and their first question was, what's that? Well, we embarked on a research project, and I can tell you that we've tested this material's ability to repel some pretty nasty bugs, like Asian citrus psyllids, which have devastated the citrus industry as well as repel something called navel orange worm, which attacks almonds. Why they call it navel orange worm attacks almonds, don't ask me. That's for the entomologists. <laughs> but the stuff is pretty amazing to that end. Now, an additional 20% of the biomass, 19% to be specific, is converted into an oil, a bio-oil. Industry uses oil, folks. We all know that. They use oil, and you can use these bios to make chemicals and plastics, put them in binders and pavements, use them as, as heating fuel, and maybe even one day as transportation fuels. 
Now, what makes this bio oil kind of unique in this process is that the oxygenated and the acidic compounds, as well as most of the moisture, have been stripped away from the oil stream and collected separately into pyroligneous acid, which is I just described. Absent some really good chemical engineering, which I didn't build, I'm not a chemical engineer, those oily and acidic streams would be collected together and coagulate into a soupy goop that is largely, largely useless for farmers or industry. So that's 49% biomass yield, excuse me, yield on the biomass. An additional 30% is converted into something called biochar, which is a recalcitrant form of carbon that resists microbial decomposition. Whereas the original plant matter is flexible, it's digestible, it's aliphatic as, as, as we can call it, biochar is rigid, it's aromatic. It's largely indigestible. This stuff decomposes at a rate of a few orders of magnitude slower than the original biomass, which means about 50% of the carbon that's fed into that reactor is now converted into a form of carbon that can remain sequestered from the atmosphere for hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. So what are the applications for this stuff? Turns out it does some really great things for farming operations to f help farmers sustainably intensify their operations. And you should all care about that because in the next couple of decades, we're going to approach 9 to 10 billion people. And current food production levels have almost got to double to feed that world. But here's the rub. 40% of the world's land is currently cultivated. 70% of the world's water already goes to agriculture. Guys, we don't have enough land and enough water to double food production at those current productivity levels. The sustainable production or sustainable intensification of agriculture is essential for all of us. Industrial applications for biochar or that carbon material can be quite interesting. It can be an insulator, it can be used in semiconductor applications, battery applications, put into pavements where it increases the rigidity and the thermal resistance of the pavement compared to its fossil fuel counterparts. So there are many applications for that, even including for filtration. The reason why I should say it helps farmers is that the material is incredibly porous and slightly charged. It holds lots of water and it holds nutrients, which means that farmers can reduce the amount of fertilizer and water use on their crops. That spread for farmers is profits, and that's a good win for, profit, or for farmers. So we've been doing the math, we got 30%, 19%, an additional 30%, that's 79% product yield on biomass. What about the other 21%? The other 21% of this stuff is a non-condensable gas, which is our energy source that we collect. You see, this process produces its own energy. It's completely exothermic. It uses no energy. There is no waste. There are no harmful pollutants produced by this. And in fact, as I said earlier, the entire process is completely carbon negative because about half of the carbon that's fed in is put into recalcitrant forms of carbon that cannot feed back into the atmosphere. So what are some of the challenges of, of doing this? They're big ones. Number one, we've got to educate industry and the world about the benefits of using these carbon negative derivatives, as well as convince industrial scale agriculture that they ought to give these products a try and offset their chemical use. And these sectors are slow to change. Moreover, regulators are very slow to approve products, even when they know that they're intrinsically safe and naturally occurring. Two, we've got some engineering challenges. Now, you can make biochar in a hole in the ground. You can make pyroligneous acid in a little still. But if you've ever done an experiment in a laboratory, you know that scaling from bench to industrial proportions is a nonlinear exercise. Remember, one of the reasons is, is because we're trying to recreate, essentially, the conditions of a very slow-burning, cool forest fire that produce these carbon-negative derivatives. And three are the economic. If you're going to create a business or any opportunity that sources carbon from the atmosphere for industries or frankly sources anything for any supply chain process, the business has to work. The problem, folks, with most biomass to X businesses is that the underlying value of the commodity X 
rarely covers the capital and operating costs. The riddle to that puzzle is really instead of producing one derivative to produce two, three, four, so think biomass to x squared, x cubed kind of derivatives. It's the only way that it can really work and scale and drive the prices down so that these kind of products can be used around the world. So I want you to think again about that billion tons of biomass that is available every year in the United States that for the most part today either rots or is burned and fed back into the atmosphere. Alternatively, 790 million tons of carbon negative products could be produced with that biomass, supply industrial supply chains, and make the atmosphere a carbon source for industries. Thank you.